This video was brought to you by Indently.io. Learning Python made simple. How's it going everyone? In today's video, we're going to be looking at five of my favorite features or features that I use quite often in Python. Starting off with feature number one, comparison chaining. For this example, I'm going to create a variable called x of type integer, and it's going to contain the value of, well, I put 10, but I wanted to put five. Next, I'm going to check whether x is greater than 10 and whether x is less than 20. And if it is, we're going to print perfect. Oh my God. I just learned that auto format changes all my single quotes to double quotes. This explains so much. Okay, I have to fix that later in Z somehow. But getting back to the code, here we're performing this comparison. And when we run this, what we're going to get as an output is nothing because the value does not fall within this range. Now there's nothing wrong with this code per se, but Python has a much cleaner approach to doing this. So instead of checking whether X is greater than 10 and whether X is less than 20, what we're going to do is chain these comparisons by checking whether X is less than 20 and greater than 10. And this time we're going to change X to 15 and we're going to rerun the code. And that's going to output perfect because X falls within this range. And you can also use other operators such as is equal to. So if X is less than 20 and equal to 10, this will evaluate to true, which in its current state doesn't work because we have 15 here. But if we change this to 10, it's going to work. And maybe this was a poor example. This logic doesn't really make sense per se. I just wanted to show you that we don't have to type in and if we want to chain these comparisons, we can just put them together. Moving on to feature number two, enumerate. And for this example, we're going to create some people, which will be a list of type string. That's going to equal Bob, Ben, Brad, and Betty. And what I want to do is iterate through these people and enumerate them at the same time. So for I in range length of people, I'm going to print I plus one and the person at the current index. And you would probably write this code if it's your first day using Python coming from a different language. But we have an easier way to do this in Python, which I will show you in just a moment. Right now, if we run this, you should see that we have our list of people nicely enumerated. But now let's move on to the Pythonic approach. So here we're going to type in for I and person in enumerate people, which is our list, and we can set a start. This is optional. If you decide to exclude this, it's going to be set to zero. And also you do not have to use the keyword. You can also just insert a number if that's what you want. I like to be extra explicit here by providing start is equal to one, but you can do what you want there. Next, we can print I and the person. And I'm just going to comment the other code snippet out so we can see what this gives us. And if we were to run it, we're going to get the exact same result from earlier. And the reason we have to use both I and person here is because enumerate returns to us tuples. So just to give you some extra context, we're going to copy this and literally just print it out. And I believe it actually gives you a memory efficient object back and enumerate object, as you can see here. So to actually see what it contains, we're going to have to convert it to something more physical, such as a list. Now, when we run that, you'll see that it contains tuples. That's why we have to loop through I and person for each one of these tuples. We want to retrieve the enumeration number and its value for each iteration. So if you get the chance, prioritize using this approach over this one because it's just more Pythonic. Up next, we have feature number three, comprehensions. And I'm not just talking about list comprehensions. We also have generator comprehensions and set comprehensions and dictionary comprehensions. This syntax will take your Python programming to the next level. For example, let's go back to people, which will be a list of type string, and that's going to contain Bob, Ben, and Brad. Now imagine you want to create another list which uppercases each one of these elements. Well, the easiest way to do that would be to use a list comprehension. Or you could also use the built-in map function, but sometimes using the list comprehension just makes more sense, especially with small data such as this one. So right below that, I'm going to type in uppercase of type list of string. And here we're going to create the list comprehension. And I'm going to abbreviate each person to P. 
So here we're going to type in p.upper for p in people. And this is a list comprehension. Now, when we print uppercase, what we're going to get back is Bob, Ben, and Brad, all uppercased. And this was much more convenient than creating an entirely new list, such as uppercase of type list of string equals none, or just equals an empty list, and using a for loop. So for person in people, uppercase dot append person dot upper. I much prefer this syntax over this syntax over here, especially if you just want to perform a simple operation. And something nice about this is that you don't even have to create a whole new variable. You can literally just use it as a variable by itself. But yeah, this isn't a dedicated tutorial on list comprehension. So if you're curious about how they work, I'm going to leave a link in the description box down below so you can learn about them. Otherwise, let's jump on to generator comprehensions, set comprehensions, and dictionary comprehensions. So for the next example, we're going to create a generator, which is going to require me to import the generator type from typing because I love using type annotations and we're going to yield an integer. We're not going to send anything inside it and we're not going to return anything. And that's going to equal x for x in range 10. Just by using parentheses, we're creating a generator comprehension. And you can verify that by typing in print gen. And when you run this, what you're going to get back is a generator object. And that just means that if you want to use the values or retrieve the values, you're going to have to use next on it. And that's going to grab values in live time. So let's do that three times, run the script, and what we should get back is zero, one, and two. Also, as a side note, if you aren't familiar with type annotations, you are not required to use this. For developers like myself who enjoy the benefits of type safety, I choose to annotate everything I can. And then I pair it with a static type checker to get the benefits of type safety. But after generator comprehensions, we also have set comprehensions. So here I'm going to create something called unique of type set of integer. And to create a set comprehension, you just have to use the curly brackets. And then you can type in something such as x for x in 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. Just insert something that has some duplicates so that when you run this, or when you print it, you'll see that it's going to remove those duplicates via list comprehension. And this probably wasn't the best example because you could obviously just wrap this in set and you'd achieve the exact same result. But I just wanted to show you that you could create set comprehensions just by using this syntax in case you have some extra logic you want to include. For example, you can multiply x by two so that when you run this, it's going to remove the duplicates and multiply each result by two. And finally, we have dictionary comprehensions. So here I'm going to create a tuple, which will contain a tuple, and each tuple is going to contain a string and an integer. And that's going to be an arbitrary amount of tuples. Then inside here, we're going to include a, one, b, two, and c, three. Next, we're going to create some data, which is going to be of type dictionary of string to integer. And here to create a dictionary comprehension, we just have to include a key and a value pair. So k and v for k v in the tuple that we created. Now, when we print the data, what we should get as a result is a1, b2, and c3. And once again, there was nothing special being done here. I mean, you could literally just print the dictionary of t and since this is in the form of a key and value pair, it's going to convert it into a dictionary for us without any special magic. But with a dictionary comprehension, you can do cool things like multiplying the value by two and uppercasing the key. So you can add some extra logic inside here, which means that when we run this, we're going to get back something like this. And as a final disclaimer, be careful with what you do inside here because you can easily make this illegible. And personally, I will always prioritize readability over these special tricks, but they're still very good to know about in case you have something simple that you want to create. Up next, we have the with block or the with keyword, which is an amazing piece of functionality that helps us work with context managers. For example, we might have a file and this file is going to be called secret.txt. Now to open it, we can type in with open file in write mode as F. And inside here we can print or we can write Bob was here. Directly below it, we're going to type in with open 
file in read mode as f, and we're just going to print the content. So f.read. And when we run this, what we should get as an output is the content of the file, which is Bob was here. And since we created the file, we can safely remove this line over here because now the file exists and all we want to do is read from it when we run the script. But that doesn't really explain what I did here or why the width block is so cool. Well, what's cool about the width block is that once again, we are using a context manager here to handle this file, which means we're opening a stream and performing changes to the file while it's open. Now, if anything goes wrong inside here, let's pretend the file gets corrupted or you try to perform an operation that doesn't work, the file is going to close automatically. We don't have to worry about opening and closing the file. It's going to take care of that for us. If we were to manually open up the file, so if we were to type in file, and here we're just going to open this in read mode, and this has to be of type text IO, because now it's a stream. But if we were to do this, we would have to take care of all the steps, which means if we want to read from it, we can do that and we can print it. But at the end of this, we also need to remember to call file.close. And it's not a difficult step to remember, but still it's a step that you have to remember. And if anything goes wrong here, for example, if you raise an exception, your program will never have the opportunity to close the file which can easily lead to memory leaks. So instead of having to worry about all of that, we can easily just use the with block with open file in read mode as file and just print file.read. And obviously we have to change this back to a string. And we're getting some syntax highlighting here because this should be F. But otherwise, once we have all of that, we can run the script and we're going to get Bob was here once again. Anyway, let's move on to the final feature of the day. And this is personally one of my favorites, decorators. For this example, I'm just going to paste in a decorator, which I created earlier. And all it does is time a function. And I'm not going to go into the specifics on how decorators work in this video. I will explain it very briefly, but if you're curious about how you can create a decorator in Python, I'm going to be leaving a link in the description box down below, which will take you to a video where you can learn how to do this. But the function is called time this, and it's going to take a function as an argument. Then inside the wrapper, we're going to time that function. And all that means is that we're going to call that function, get the start time, the end time, and then print this string over here that tells us exactly how long that function took. Now, this is what a decorator looks like in action. So what we're going to do is use at time this, create a function, which is going to be called fast function, and it's going to return none. And we're going to sleep for 0.5 seconds. Now I'm going to copy this and paste it directly under and create something called slow function and sleep for two seconds. And finally, the last thing we need to do is call the fast function and the slow function. And what we're going to get as an output is that it's timing our fast function it's going to return how long it actually took. And then it's going to time the slow function and tell us how long that took. And all we had to do is annotate the function with a decorator to be able to use that functionality. As soon as we remove the decorator, it goes back to being a regular function. So now if we run this, we're not going to see anything because the functions are just running as normal. And what's awesome about this is that you can create a separate module and import this into any script without actually affecting the functionality of your script. Because once again, you might have a lot of functions in your script and you might want to use some external functionality here and there to see how things work. So once again, all you need to do is annotate the function that you actually want to get the time back for with your decorator. And that will apply this functionality to any function you use. And timing a function is a very simple example on how this can be used, but there are much more creative examples out there on the internet, which will inspire you to code differently. But yeah, those were five of my favorite features in Python. There are plenty more that I really enjoy, but those were the first five that came to my mind when I think about Python. I would love to hear what your favorite features are in the comment section down below. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.